Uh, they, they, well, I'm going to introduce, but uh, Mr. President, Dr. Biden. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you uh, for being the architects of the Moon program and for ARPA H and what a difference it made. And what this is is to show you the impact of your initiative. Bottom line, it saves lives. Mm -hmm. This will save lives. Um, and you should be very proud. And we're very thankful um, for this initiative. What we have here um, is a group of, of the researchers on this project, um, which um, is, it, it, it really vindicates um, ARPA-H and the program, because this would never be funded by ordinary process, mm -hmm. incremental process. It's a moonshot, and it's hit paper. Um, and it allows us to literally uh, determine the pathology while the patient's on the table. Wow. Um, so it, in a sense, uh, prevents uh, follow-up surgery. Uh -huh. um, so I, I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, I should, th this is the impresario uh, of, of this. <laughs> I don't know if I've seen it. Mr. President, good to see you again. Yeah. Hi, Jill. Dr. Biden, good to see you again. Hi, Jill Biden. Hi, nice to see you. Yes. Hi, nice to see you. Hi, Joe. 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 So, yeah, so again, thank you both for coming down. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, choosing the Lowe's to be a place where you announce this really great program. I want to thank Dr. Lagarzin for, uh, for being here, um, and uh, Dr. Juan Honku, who is the PSI program manager. Uh, we're really excited to be a part of this. And I also want to congratulate the other teams around the country who are part of this mm -hmm. initiative. Um, so, the PSI program is really about um, what if the question they ask is what if surgeries worked flawlessly every time? And so, um, as you know, uh, when you have a cancer diagnosis and cancer surgery is one of the first things that, that the doctor wants to do, one of the things the patient's worried about is, will the, will the surgeon be, will be able to remove, remove all of the tumor? Sure. Right? And so, the way that that happens now, so I, I like to use the analogy of like orange. So they are, the idea is to remove the entire tumor with a normal rim of normal tissue around it. So if you think about an orange, so the orange pulp is the tumor and the orange rind is the margin. Mm -hmm you don't want any orange pulp poking through the outside. So that means that there's cancer cells on the edge, there's cancer cells on the edge of the thing that's removed, there's cancer inside the patient. So how do they test that now? So now, uh, there's a few things they can do in the operating room, but they basically have to guess. So maybe you have a tumor, I was just three print on it. Uh, you pick a spot, say, oh, I'm worried about here, and you send it. But if you got the wrong spot, then you don't know. So what they do is they send this to a lab, they fix it in formaldehyde, they cut it into slices, they put that into a wax block, each of those slices gets sliced on a fancy deli slicer called a microtome, and you end up with a microscope. And so for a single tumor, a pathologist will, you know, on a microscope just like the one behind us, they look at 50 to 100 of these uh, to determine, is there any tumor on the outside? So um, that takes days to a week, and clearly that's too long uh, to change the surgery at time. So we, we want to give the surgeon tools so that they know while the patient's on the table, is there any remaining cancer mm -hmm. and where is it? Yes, we, we don't want to come back for another surgery. We don't want to, their, their cancer to come back. And, and Dr. Turner is going to talk later about even some patients can't have another surgery. So it's, it's really important to get it right the first time. So we just need better tools. Um, and so uh, the project that we, we, we're working on is called Magic Scan, and it's built on some, some work we've been doing for a number of years now. So actually we're going to do a live demonstration here. Uh, so we actually have some stake. We don't have a tumor. Uh, we, have some, we have some meat. Um, and so the way that we do this is instead of physically cutting it, we optically cut it. We use the light to give us a, a microscopic image of the surface. And the way we do that is just, it's a you know, little funny here, but we just dip it in this, this tissue and dyes, and then we dry it off. And then we put it on the scanner. Um, and so uh, my PhD student, Ivan Bozic, is going to show you how this works. So, sir, when we have a sample on the, on the scanner, we can uh, press uh, the run in a solder. And the uh, microscope will start scanning uh, and take firing uh, images of the stake surface. And as you can see on the, on the video, uh, it's automatically sticking in a panorama like on your own. Uh, and, uh, this is how stake looks uh, under fluorescent <laughs> microscope. <laughs> However, not every fluorescent microscope. So in a normal one, it's, it will be a blue image, but what, what, what the spins is saying, they are doing optical section mm -hmm. and acquiring only a thin, uh, thin layer of uh -huh. the surface. 
So uh, furthermore, after we collected the image, we actually can open it in Viewer. And as in Google Map, we can uh, zoom in on different areas. Uh, so, for example, each each this line is actually one of the mic, uh, one of the meat fiber, muscle fiber, and uh, blue dots are actually uh, nuclei, nu nucleus. And here we see adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, fat tissue, and the fat tissue of the steak. Yeah. So, so we've not only imaged meat, obviously. Um, but we have image human tissue as well. So um, if we could go to the next slide. So um, this is an example of skin. And so on the left, we have normal skin. And so that zoom is showing actually a hair follicle. Let's see what that kind of long thing is with the hair going in that. Um, and then the things beside it are like glands, like sebaceous glands. And then on the right, we have an example of tumor. And so this is a patient that had a basal cell carcinoma. Um, this was actually taken at a decent at a clinic. And so uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brian Suba, who is a professor of computer science at Tulane. He's going to talk about how we're going to go from here, right? So uh, how are we going to speed this up? What are we going to do about the data? He's going to talk about that. Thank you. So this skin example is about uh, one or two square centimeters. And the machine right now can scan that in a couple minutes, which is fast enough for a surgeon to know whether or not there's cancer and to make a decision. But things get more difficult as we get to other types of cancer. So here's that same skin uh, example, but now we have one side of the prostate. Right? So this side right here is about 12 times bigger than, it, because it's bigger, it takes about 10 to 12, 12 to 15 minutes for the scanner to scan it. So right there, we're almost at the cusp of how being too long for a patient to be under waiting for a decision. And unfortunately, the cancer can occur on any side of the prostate. So here's an example of an image that we've scanned every side of the prostate. This is about 40 times bigger than our skin example, okay? And it would take 45 minutes with the current technology to be able to scan it. So because of this program, because of the moonshot, what we're going to build is a device that will scan areas that are 600 times bigger than our skin example and do it in less than 10 minutes, meaning that it will be able to uh, scan the entire surface of a tumor in time enough to make a decision for a patient that's still under anesthesia. So this device we're going to build will produce a massive amount of data, and that's where the computational team uh, that I'm part of will come in. Right, so this will, this will produce about one trillion pixels per patient. And there's no way a human could look at a trillion pixels in 10 minutes and be able to make a decision and to see if there are cancer cells there or not. So what we'll do is we'll rely on uh, sort of advanced uh, techniques and artificial intelligence and machine learning to scan the images as they come off of the device and automatically detect when a cancer cell appears. Right? The model will be accurate such that the surgeon will uh, be confident that they removed all the tumor, but also will not give false positives and make the surgeon remove uh, healthy tissue. We'll also design a machine that will do this uh, that will work in a rural setting. It's very important for us to have that. So we're not going to rely on some uh, you know, high-performance infrastructure to, to, to do the computation. We're not going to have to be able to upload it to the cloud to do computation because it's, about, it's going to be about two to three terabytes. So we'll have a single box that will do all of this in, 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 one, in one go. So is this box in the operating room? Yes. 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 So yeah. either be in the operating room or maybe your body. Oh. So like maybe a central room where they could bring this space in. Right. So this right. is a mobile unit as well, right? Yes. That's, to take That's to the, the idea. Room. Yes. You could have it on a cart or uh -huh. a or Yes. Okay. So while, so we can detect cancer using the machine learning approaches, but the the uh, surgeon only really cares about where on the tumor the cancer cells are. Okay? So while we're actually doing the high-resolution microscopy, we'll scan the tumor in, in, uh, with a 3D scanner to produce a 3D model, and we'll be able to map where the cancer cells are directly on this model so they can relate to where in the patient they have to remove more tissue. So this uh, project is a collaboration with several research universities, medical centers, and industry partners. Um, and uh, it's only possible through your uh, leadership and support. Um, when we build the device, I hope we will come back and, and see the device in action. Um, so we have a great team. I would say uh, pretty much the dream team to handle this kind of, uh, this kind of device. 
uh, one of our team members, Dr. Jacqueline Turner, who is a professor of surgery at Tulane Middle School, will talk about how such a device would actually affect your practice. So, yes, welcome. Thank you for having us. Um, as a colorectal surgeon, this is something that we deal with constantly um, every time we go to the operating room. I think Dr. Brown chose colon and rectal surgery um, to be involved because colon cancer is the third most common cancer worldwide. Um, it accounts for 10% of all cancer cases. Unfortunately, in Louisiana, we have one of the highest prevalences of colon and rectal cancer. We are the sixth leading um, states in cancer deaths. So we definitely um, take this home. Um, cancer recurrence is one of the reasons that we have a high recurrence rate, uh, or a high death rate. Cancer recurrence occurs from anywhere between 7 and 42 percent, um, depending on the stage, and surveying the patients during that five years after treatment. So there are things that affect cancer recurrence, such as margins, as we've talked about, the distal margin, the, the radial margin, the margin around the tumor, all that affects um, their survival. So when the patient is in your office and we're surveying them um, for at least five years, the thing that they're most concerned about is, is my cancer coming back? And that's the you know, dreaded thing that we have to tell them you know, as a physician. Also, we have the pressure, as Dr. Brown mentioned, of getting it right the first time during that index operation. So with that, you know, conventionally we have the pathology team that will take the specimen. And it takes about one to two weeks to process a specimen. It's a long time, a lot of anxiety for the patient. So the magic scanner will help us get real-time feedback if we have to go in and, you know, take out a little bit more. It gives us that real-time feedback that we need to ultimately reduce recurrence rates and improve survival. Now, I had a patient a couple of months ago that had colon cancer had a recurrence, unfortunately. Recurrence recurred at a spot that was in a difficult location near vital structures. So not only am I dealing with this current recurrence, I also have to make sure that we provide safety first for the patient. So, you know, getting accurate margin status was crucial. Fortunately, we were, and we did it with frozen sections. So that's where we take the biopsy and take it to the pathologist, and they look at it under a microscope and gives us a preliminary result, but it's like picking a weed out of a field of flowers. We're picking the area that's most suspicious. But with this technology, we can get real-time feedback to know if we need to go back and get more, again, during that one operation. So that... You know if, have a yeah, so if the first person comes down, it's clear. If it's clear, we're good. But if, it, if that frozen section comes back positive, we often have to core out more tissue. And again, we won't, sometimes we won't even know until we send off the investment to the pathologist. And again, they tell us one to two weeks later that, hey, well, actually your margins were positive. Mm -hmm. So that's why this technology would be a great benefit uh, for us as surgeons in the operating room. And ultimately, it, the bottom line, like Dr. Uh, President Fentz said, it is, it's about the patient. We have to do this for the patient. It will. Um, have them a, give them a better experience, prolong their lives, and um, having them to avoid having to go at, at additional treatment and surgeries. How is this fundamentally different from the use of telescopes? Yeah, so it's actually kind of similar in a way. So the, op the optics community has learned a lot from astronomy. So uh, when you look into the night sky, you're looking through clouds, and you know, and so all the light that's coming from the stars is sort of being scattered and filtered by the clouds. When we look into tissue, we have the same problem. You know, light doesn't go through our tissue. Um, so we've, we've learned a lot uh, from that community. And how do we get very clear images of some thick specimen that light doesn't go straight through? Mm -hmm. And so it's similar to a telescope in that we're seeing small things far away, right? So we're, we're, we're seeing, like, these individual cells of this piece of meat, um, whereas a telescope, we're trying to see stars that are very far away. But, uh, they're a lot bigger. The telecoms are a lot bigger. <laughs> Why, did, oh, oh, please. Why did you choose oncology? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, um, I think it takes a special person to care for patients because as a surgeon, I, it's actually more than just operating. It's, it's, I, I feel like I'm the social worker. I'm the... Um, you know, I, I, I do a lot more than just cancer care. Excellent. And with having that patience to sit there, so my cancer appointments take about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. 
um, to, to sit down and do some mental counseling. I had a patient today in clinic that had just really bad anxiety. So the first 15 minutes of the appointment, I had to address the anxiety first so that he could process his, his, his personal health. So um, I, you know, I realized that at some point during my career that this is what I need to do to make an impact. So that's, that's why I went into it. You know, the reason I started the one shot years ago and came up with this new technology, not technology, but the RPH, is that um, I literally traveled around the world, every major cancer research facility in the world, from Australia to Ireland to Turkey, all across the world. And what I learned was docs don't share information. Everybody walked by a mirror looking in the mirror as if they were the next Nobel Prize to be won. I'm serious. Shameful. Shameful. The failure to share that information. Even when the wall required when we gave money for that, that they have to share and write reports. And so, is that attitude changing? We take an oath, and we're supposed to. I hope, I would have to hope that that attitude is changing. I think definitely, so I'm also vice chair of surgical education um, for the Department of Sur Surgery. So we're doing more than just teaching, you know, how to cut. We have a lot of mental health resources for our residents. We're, we go over a lot of the um, ethical uh, issues, especially when we're talking about our cases each week during our morbidity and mortality conference. And hopefully they're we're leading by example now. So it's about setting a precedent. What should you tell you? Because I tell you, 20 years ago, there was virtually no sharing. And the law required it. Well, the NIH is, I mean, well, the, you know, the government has really stepped this up in the past several years. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, right, in terms of, like, making the data available. Uh, Dr. Right. Fitt, I mean, President Fitz can tell you about this, about, you know, Tulane is like, we have to make our data available. And, <laughs> and so that's the thing we have to do, and that's great. And so I think, I mean, this is taxpayer money that pays for this data, yeah. right? And so, especially in this new age with artificial intelligence and machine learning, the data is what drives it all. And so we, ha we actually have a different project uh, that's related to pathology. We're trying to democratize... I'm not trying to do a pitch, but we're trying to democratize access to this type of imaging where we can get more data from non elite places, right? So we want to get data from Homo, Louisiana, Columbia, Louisiana, where I grew up, um, not just the coast, right? And so um, we need to share that. And so I, I think it's changing. I think it's, a lot of it's because the government has, has told us to, and that's great. Um, but I think ARPA-H is it's it's a bell. Right, right. And I think ARPA-H, this model is great because it's... You know, in this particular program, there's multiple teams. And it's positive yeah. competition, right? So we're going to work together, and it's exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for doing thank you. this. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just thank do a, a commercial for them? They don't want to say it themselves, but these are people across three different schools and numerous universities. And it's exactly the type of collaboration you were talking about that leads to big outcomes like this. And that was the whole point of our bridge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.